Well, good morning. At least it is for me. And it is Friday, and it's the 8th of May. Um, and we've been working our way through Mark's Gospel, and I've been wondering out loud, and we did... I don't know, the first half of chapter five yesterday, and I want to do the second half of chapter five today. So look at that. We're going to do a chapter in two days. We're flying. Um, so this is Mark chapter 21 through 43. And so again, just to recap, Mark's an action movie. Things happen. Boom, 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 boom. Um, Jesus is baptized, goes out and, and, and confronts himself, basically, and, and confronts the devil um, calls disciples, begins to to heal. So we, we go through the action, and then we start to hear a little bit about how that works. And so he's he seems to be doing a lot of exorcism, a lot of people with, with, with demons, and I had some thoughts about that before. Uh, and rather than walking along the shoreline, Jesus seems to be going back and forth and back and forth across the water. We went into parables at one point, and then I've begun to wonder whether parables aren't just a way that Jesus teaches, but also a way that we talk about Jesus. So can we understand these stories themselves as parables? Which is to say, the stories are dynamic and change all the time, that we're meant to take them personally, to wonder about them, and to expect them to change. And it's okay for us, as we hear the story, to identify with different parts of the story. I mean, if it's a simple thing like the parable of the sower, we can identify and wonder, so what does it mean to be the seed that's thrown on the on the stony ground? We can ask ourselves, what does it mean to be the stony ground itself or, or, or the fertile ground? What does it mean to be the sower? All of these things are, are important. So as we hear these stories that, that seem a little more historical, they seem to be reporting events that Jesus um, participated in, I think we could also, though, treat them as parables and wonder ourselves. Um, am I the woman who touches the hem of his garment? Uh, wonder about it from the from the part the point of view of Jesus. Wonder about it um, from the point of view of the community. Wonder about it as the as the little girl who was dead and will be alive again. Uh, I know I'm spoil alert there. I'm telling you some things that are about to happen. But I really do invite you just to, to, to let your imagination go and not imagine for a moment that this is um, uh, a, a history exam um, or that you will be quizzed and expected to re be able to recite. I want you to be able to wonder. So here we go. Let's, let's wrap up Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. We're at verse 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, See what I mean? He's going back and forth. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the sea. And then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians, had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And all the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they'd said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he'd entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? 
The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And he put them all outside. And he took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. And he strictly ordered them that no one should know this. And then told them to give her something to eat. So, another couple of healings. One, one apparently um, by, by Jesus' actions, he means to do it. And the other, um, as if the healing was taken from him. Uh, he gives his permission or his forgiveness after the fact. But, but, uh, but isn't that interesting uh, that we've put these two stories together? Um, Jesus heals and healing is taken in a sense from Jesus just being in his presence. And I, I, I can wonder about that a lot. I, I wonder also, um, both of these stories are about women. Uh, and um, I, I note that the first woman that we meet, she has been hemorrhaging for, for 12 years, it says. Um, so you have to understand that when Jesus said, who touched me, uh, and looked around at the crowd and his disciples were going like, who can tell? It's, it's busy here. Yeah, but who touched me? And she comes forward and tells him the truth and tells him the story. That was a scary, gutsy, brave, almost incredible thing that she did there. To begin with, mm, women shouldn't touch men. Not even familiar men in public, but certainly not strange men. Uh, you don't approach uh, a rabbi, a leader, that way. But more than that, if you have been hemorrhaging for 12 years, if you have an issue of blood, you are unclean in community and you shouldn't be touching anybody at all. You remember the parable of the Good Samaritan and, and, and one of the reasons uh, that the priest um, and, and, and the Levite pass by the body is if you touch someone who's bleeding, if you, if you come in contact with blood, you are ritually unpure and you can't do your holy function for, for, for a period of time. So she actually says to Jesus, yeah, I, I did it. There were people who would have been stoned for doing that very thing. And so she risked her own life to tell the truth. I think there's something very powerful in that. But I also think it's important to recognize this woman had been bleeding for 12 years. This woman was ritually unclean. This woman was of no value in community. As far as the community was concerned, she really, she was worthless. And Jesus heals her. Now her bravery, her faith has a big part to do with it. But the fact is that he does. And I find it interesting that we companion that with a 12-year-old girl. Again, children not valued. Um, when Jesus says, as we know famously, let the children come to me. It's kind of a radical statement, frankly. You didn't want children to come to you. Um, yours, maybe. Um, but others, no. Children were not valued. Not particularly at all. Um, so... So here is a story of Jesus being present with people of no value. And there is definitely uh, a feminist statement being made here. I have no doubt about that. Um, but there is also a community standard statement being made about this too. You are not of value to us until you can serve us. As, as a little girl, you are of value when you can start producing children. She's not there yet as far as they're concerned. She's of no value. This woman who is bleeding, she can't produce children. She is ritually unclean. She's of no value. We don't want you. Jesus crosses the water and comes. And what he does is heal people who are of no value. Hmm. Every now and again, I have felt like I am of diminished value even no value. And as I hear the story, it's good to know that even 
though I may feel that I'm of no value, even though the community might feel that I am worthless, God doesn't think that. God is concerned for me. God is just as concerned for me as Jesus is concerned for a 12-year-old girl or an unclean woman. I need to hear that from time to time. So that puts me, that, that helps me if I put my, my, my mind in, in that of, of, of the woman or of the little girl. Um, but I am also uh, able to imagine what it was to be Jairus. Um, to come and ask Jesus to help his little girl, that, that sense of desperation. I mean, he is a leader of the synagogue, so he's not, he's not at odds with Jesus, but he is part of the established church. And as we've discovered, Jesus is breaking away from the established, I say church, you know, religious organization. Jesus is breaking away from that, but in his desperation, Jairus goes and asks, please, please help me. If Jesus fails in this, um, Jairus risks losing face. He looks, he, he looks desperate and he got nothing for it. That, that doesn't go over very well, but he doesn't care. And again, I don't know about you, but I have had moments in my life when I have felt desperate, like I was grasping at straws and you know what? Those are the moments sometimes that are, have been the most holy the moments when I have been most aware of God's presence and God's power. Um, not when I am comfortable and things are going fairly well for me, but in fact, when I have been afraid or scared, uh, when I didn't know what else to do. It's funny, I think sometimes uh, we come to God when we tried every other option and there is nothing left. We heard that from the woman who was hemorrhaging. She tried every other option. There was nothing left but to come to Jesus. We hear that from Jairus. His daughter is sick and he doesn't know what to do. And, and those of us who, who are parents understand that desperation. What, what wouldn't you do to help your child? Those moments of desperation, I have no choice but to come to God. <laughs> I tell you, if you come to me for help and I'm your last choice, there's a part of me that goes, oh, I guess, fine. So you don't think of me first. You don't even think of me 10th. You, you, you're coming to me because you have nowhere else to go. And I might even leverage that just a little bit. I'd like to think I wasn't petty, but I also know the truth. But in this story, Jesus reveals a God who is not petty at all. Whether you come to your faith, whether you come to God in times of, of, of feast and times of comfort and you have time to reflect and say, you know, I want to I know you more, God. I, I want to be more open to you. If you come to God that way, God responds. But God also responds if you come to God out of desperation, having tried everything else and there's nothing left. You might as well give it a shot. God is also presence present. There is no pettiness in God. At least I get that from the story. And I'm going to tell you, when I hear some of my fellow Christians or, or, or people of faith talk about God, the God they reveal is often very, very petty. This is the God who is going to, who is going to um, uh, punish a, a country or, or a planet for our misdeeds. Um, we have done something. We don't pray enough, so therefore God has sent COVID-19. I've heard that. We are too acceptable of those people um, that, that the church would um, disregard. And you can fill in the blanks there. There's all sorts of, and they'll tell you, and that's why God is punishing us. This petty God that they keep coming back to um, is in direct contrast, direct conflict with the God that's revealed by Jesus here. A woman who is desperate and has nothing to lose reaches out and breaks all the rules. She essentially assaults Jesus. It's a gentle assault, but it's an assault. He didn't invite it. And yet God is present for her. A father who is desperate. Part of the establishment, not particularly open to what Jesus is doing. 
might have been personally, but institutionally, he's not out of desperation. He asks him, please come and heal my daughter. And Jesus does. There are a lot of things that we could pick up in this story, but I think, I think that's enough for me for the moment. So I, I will close in prayer in a moment and uh, remind you that um, I won't be posting on the weekend. Um, so have, um, have a terrific weekend. And uh, we'll connect again on Monday. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your presence. The presence we experience when we take the time to slow down and ask of you, what do you want us to do in this moment? The presence we discover when we look deep within, when we read scripture and wonder. But God, we also thank you for your presence in those times of desperation when, when we seem to be flailing about emotionally, physically, however it may be, and we come to you as a last resort and you still respond in love. You help to make us whole. You emphasize our value you recognize our worth even when the community says we have no value even when we ourselves deep inside feel worthless you say no not so little girl little boy little one get up We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, my friends. See you on Monday.